Hello and welcome to part B of our amphibians uh, series. We're going to be talking today specifically about frogs and toads. Probably the most recognizable of our amphibians uh, species that you will know of. Frogs and toads are of course different, we know that. Uh, there are some differences in not only their anatomy and their identification, but also in their physiology. So this is a handy chart and it's just a very simple, sort of very, very easy to, to understand comparison between both frogs and toads. So from a very sort of anatomical level, even the hind legs of frogs and toads differ in the, fence, in the sense that frogs have very longer legs for jumping, toads have very shorter legs for walking or hopping. Of course in frogs, eggs are laid in clusters, the young live in the water, and the toads, the eggs are actually laid in long chains, and some of course um, are young live in water and some don't. The skin of a frog is moist and smooth, the toad's skin of course is dry and bumpy. Amphibians, of course, and frogs keeping very close to water, and toads being amphibians, but also mostly being terrestrial. Of course, in terms of habitat, they prefer moist environments for frogs, for gas exchange, and for their aquatic um, food sources. Toads prefer drier environments, uh, and also the invertebrates that go with those environments as well. Uh, in terms of teeth, frogs have remoran teeth in their upper jaw, and toads have no teeth whatsoever. The eyes of a frog bulge out, and the eyes of a toad do not. And also toads have an interesting poison gland or product gland beneath or behind the eyes. So as we just mentioned, between frogs and toads there are differences. Toads, for example, have two kidney-shaped rays, parotoid glands just behind their eyes which contain toxins. These are interesting because when an enemy attacks a toad, it will protect itself by squirting this poison. Not all toads, of course, are harmful to humans, um, but they will hurt other uh, species that will try and prey on them. Frogs do not have um, poison glands behind their eyes, but of course we know that there are some species of frog which actually can contain a poison uh, and ooze it from the uh, specialized glands in their skin. Frogs, interestingly enough, have web feet, as we know, fitting with their aquatic environment and swimming, whereas we know that toad's feet have separated toes to facilitate walking. So again, these are some of the differences that we see anatomically between frogs and toads. So most amphibians we know will breed in the spring, immediately following an overwintering hibernation. They're awakened by changes not only in light and temperature, but also by rising water levels associated with the spring melt. Frogs are usually very, very dimorphic in terms of size and also in terms of coloration. They can vary, uh, or they gather, sorry, for re um, breeding or, or pre-copulation by gathering around bodies of fresh water, of course, producing those traditional and typical vocalizations we hear to attract females. Groups of males, if there is a receptive female around, will scramble to meet with that female, and the males will mount the female in amplexus, or piggyback position, for hours or days at a time, not only, of course, to ensure that other males are, um, are unable to mate with her, but also, of course, to ensure that when she does produce her eggs, they are the first opportunity to fertilize them. When the female is actually ready to lay eggs, uh, she will produce uh, an eggs in, in, a, in, a, in a group, anywhere from one to hundreds of eggs. The male, of course, which is waiting to fertilize the eggs, will then release their, their sperm in before the protective jelly sac takes full form. That is, of course, the, um, the equivalent of protecting the eggs from the external environment. Eggs are laid, of course, extremely close to or in a body of water. Um, others may lay eggs in drier areas and keep the eggs moist via urine or supplementary water. So there are different species uh, changes depending on breeding patterns, but by and large, very close or always in aquatic environments. In terms of development, this is something you probably will be very familiar with, of course, is that the eggs being externally fertilized and being housed externally will go through series of developmental stages many of which until they become a fully fledged adult. The length of time it takes from an egg to hatch uh, and then of course will depend on, on, on the species of course. Eggs are extremely vulnerable hence of course they're in a protective egg jelly sac. Um, tadpoles, again the length of time where they are in fact tadpoles varies depending species. They spend their lives very closer to shore in order to avoid aquatic predators but also avoid swimming deeper into, into environments where they will be uh, eaten by fish. The, again, depending on the species, metamorphosis will take varying lengths of time, um, or, or in some case, years. There are many species of frogs and toads, uh, and, and you can see them all listed here. These are the ones that we're going to cover in this course. Chorus frog, spring peeper, gray tree frog, bullfrog, green frog, wood frog, northern leopard frog, pickerel frog, mink frog, American toad, and fowler's toad. So as you can see, there are two toads in our list, but the vast majority of what we're going to be covering are frogs.
In terms of frog identification, there are several um, characteristics that we use. Certainly one is the color and pattern of the dorsal surface and legs. There is also a interesting uh, anatomical feature called the dorsal lateral fold. You can see here it's pointing or, or being directed by the, the top point bullet there. You can see it's a ridge that basically runs right alongside where the back and the sides connect to the frog in some species. Some species is entirely absent. So again, the presence or absence of that characteristic is one of our identifiers. The tympanum, which is essentially the ear sort of cavity of it, um, that relative size and position for some species is a unique identifier. So our first frog species that we're going to uh, examine today is a chorus frog. This is a very tiny frog, so we're looking between 1.9 to 3.9 centimeters, so if you think about relative size with your fingers, that's very, very small. Um, they're usually brown, maybe slightly reddish or tan color, their toes and an ex slightly expanded pads, but what's key about them is their stripe nature. So if you look, you can see three very distinct stripes running all the way basically from the tip of their lip all the way down through their, so over their eyes and then down sort of the back of their body. So you'll see that very unique patterning present in this frog. Notice at the top of this PowerPoint there is a sound file that's embedded there. There is another PowerPoint that's uh, attached within the, the module for this section that has all of the unique vocalizations for each frog as well as the identifying features. We've, we've put that in a separate um, PowerPoint file so that you can access those sounds separately from just studying the identification features. This frog is found in central and southern Ontario, as you can see here by the range. And what's interesting about this frog is it's actually one of Ontario's earliest breeders. So it can be heard anywhere from late March to early April. Uh, and the call is very unique. So it has a very kind of a sound like passing your thumb down a comb. Very unique sort of guttural noise. The young frogs, of course, forage in the open woodlands and fields and prey upon invertebrates like beetles, flies, and mosquitoes. The spring peeper is our second species. This is also a very small frog. If you see the uh, the size here, two to, two to about four centimeters long. It's brown or tan or slightly gray. And what's interesting is the X on its back. So you can see this unique X marking. Sometimes it's not fully complete in some juvenile uh, animals, but in this case, you'll see a very clearly uh, that X marks the spot, which is characteristic of a spring peeper. You can find the spring peeper usually in temporary woodland ponds, nicely shaded, which are formed by rain or melting snow in early spring. They're encountered in those uh, areas as well. And starting in March, April, and May, you'll hear these characteristic peep, peep, peep calls from these woodland pools. Males will also call in September and October on rainy nights. And as you can see, one of their by their range, they're one of the most pervasive frogs in terms of their, um, their range map. They are, however, being very small. They are not necessarily the easiest and the most readily able to be seen. But certainly, they will be heard. The gray tree frog is our next frog. It's slightly larger, three to six centimeters long. It has moist, warty skin. So you can see, other than the other ones, you can actually see definitive warts here. Adhesive pads, um, its, it's um, uh, feet and, of course, its uh, forelimbs are very different, uh, made for gripping, of course. It's got a light gray to brown texture. Um, and, of course, one of the interesting things about it is the underside of its hind legs and groin is actually bright orange. I know you can't really see it here. You can sort of just see the outline of the yellow, but it is one of those unique characteristics. Notice how the patterning changes from the back also to the belly. So very unique feature there. And notice, of course, the large inflatable sac, which is used for vocalizations. This particular frog is found in woodlands and marshes in the summer. They prefer wetlands with shrubs, um, in particular willow and dogwood. They'll breed in marshes and ponds and still backwaters and streams. Males are extremely territorial and will defend their perches by shoving, kicking, calling, etc. The eggs are laid singly or in groups, and but are attached to submerged plants. And they, of course, the eggs being laid will turn into tadpoles and mature very quickly and will usually transform by August, or early September. So here you can see by the range map, they're limited to most south and east Ontario and a little slice of western Ontario as well. I'd like to introduce our next frog, which is our largest frog in Ontario, the bullfrog. Anywhere from about not 10 to 20 centimeters long, it is certainly has unique coloration and definitely a, a, a unique vocalization, which you probably have heard. Um, the skin is green or yellowish green, um, smooth when young, but as it gets older, it gets bumpier and bumpier. Males, of course, in in some cases, will will have different colorations in and around the the lips and the mouth. 
the dorsal lateral folds are absent. So notice, like in some of the frogs, we have that line going all the way down. It actually doesn't. It actually, as you can see, flips here and turns and goes right down to the shoulder, not down the, the side of the back. Also notice the size of the tympanum, or that ear covering. That's going to be very important as we uh, compare that to other species. The bullfrog prefers shorelines of lakes and bays, as well as in beaver ponds or slow-moving rivers. Um, they are not necessarily active usually in the spring, but males, bullfrogs, do not establish their uh, territory until May or June. They are very territorial. They will defend their breeding territory, and their eggs, interestingly enough, are laid in floating masses that float throughout the water column. Um, tadpoles spend the winter in the water and transform the following summer, so they have an over one year development time. If you look at the range map, you'll see that they're limited basically to essentially halfway up Ontario, so mostly in eastern and southern Ontario. An interesting uh, fact about the bullfrog is, the, as I mentioned, the size of the tympanum. If the tympanum is larger than the frog's eye, so if you compare the two, you're looking at a male bullfrog. If it's approximately the same size as the frog's eye, you're looking at a female bullfrog. So this is one of the sexually dimorphic traits you can tell. Why would a male frog be more concerned about, um, well, the size of their ear? Of course, that they need to do that, of course, to establish territories and to ensure that they're uh, being able to pick up as many sounds from local males as they possibly can. So an interesting evolutionary life history that has resulted in a dimorphic uh, experience for males and females. The size of the tympanum is not only important for the bullfrog in terms of determining sexes, but it's also really important in contrasting the bullfrog from the green frog. Now the green frog you can see is significantly smaller. It's between only 6 to 10 centimeters, so it's roughly about half the size of a bullfrog. Um, and there are several unique features which differentiate this apart. The dorsal lateral folds, in this case, you can see extend all the way down the ridge. That's differing than the bullfrog. And also notice the size of the tympanum relative to the eye. That's another feature that we use in identification of the green frog. Now, in terms of male uh, green frogs, they have yellow throats, particularly during the breeding season. They're found in many, many habitats, uh, anywhere where there's basically permanent supply of water. Um, they prefer rich, weedy, warm ponds and lakes with slow-moving rivers. They don't breed until about June or July, so they're relatively late. Their call is quite interesting. It's associated with the twang of a banjo. And the tadpoles will spend the winter in the water, same as the bullfrog, and only transform the following summer. So again, they are have a relatively extensive range throughout Ontario, uh, certainly a little bit larger than the bullfrog. So you can see how they have extended all the way, not only southern eastern Ontario, but uh, creeping up to the north as well. A wood frog is our next frog that we're going to discuss. It's relatively small again, very different than the green frog and the bullfrog. Some people might confuse it with the spring peeper with the X on its back. However, as you can see from its identification features, that's not the case. Yes, they can be similar color, brown, mostly brown. They do have the prominent dorsolateral folds, but in this case, the key defining feature is the, the dark brown mask that covers basically from the eye down to the shoulder, and it, you can see extending towards the lip. So those are key features that differentiates the wood frog. The wood frog, like its name, is usually found in woodlands, in, in ponds that have emergent vegetation like sedges or cattails, etc. The interesting thing about this wood frog is that it's freeze tolerant. So it is the only North American amphibian found north of the Arctic Circle. You can see its range is everywhere in Ontario. It will actually be able to freeze and then thaw the following year, which is very interesting. It's our earliest spring breeder. Males, um, they will quack like a duck, essentially, will start or can be heard anywhere from the last week of March to the first week of April. The eggs hatch in about one to two weeks, and the tadpoles will transform into adults in 60 days. They will feed on other invertebrates like beetles, mosquitoes, um, spiders, and flies, and they are quite abundant, although they are challenging to see given their relative small size and coloration. By and large, the most common frog you will likely have seen is the northern leopard frog. This is one that, of course, is you know, 5 to 11 centimeters long. They're greenish brown. They have a variable number of, of rounded spots and a prominent light colored dorsolateral fold. You can see usually in white. So again, one of the key identifying features of this frog, in contrast with some of the other species, is the number of rows of spots that you see. Most northern leopard frogs will have more than two rows of spots. In this case, you can see there are clearly three different rows of spots. So row one, row two, row three. This will contrast it with other species that will not have more than two rows of spots. The northern leopard frog is found well, in a lot of aquatic environments, light lakes, grassy, grassy ponds, marshes, wet meadows. Uh, it's certainly um, 
a very prolific frog. The females will arrive at breeding ponds approximately one week after the males start calling. Um, they are relatively prolific breeders, so they will produce quite a number of eggs, which are laid a week later and attached to submerged vegetation. After hatching, the tadpoles will take only about 10 to 13 weeks to transform into froglets, and by September, the froglets will have doubled in weight and are about 5 centimeters long. They'll hibernate in deep pools and sometimes can be seen on the surface of mud under the water. Our next frog is the pickerel frog. Uh, it's a, again similar relative in size, 4.4 to 8.7 centimeters. In this case, the color is different. You can see rather than being the, like the northern leopard frog, green and white, this is actually a, a tan or a gray color with some olive. Very prominent um, white dorsal lateral folds, as you can see. But what also contrasts this pickerel frog from the leopard frog is not only color, which is, as you can see, different, but also you can see there's only two rows of spots. So the spots are also larger, okay? They occur between the folds, and you can see they're much more, um, more regular, and there are fewer of them than the northern leopard frog. Uh, the pickerel frog will usually start calling in May, and eggs are laid and attached to submerged vegetation. They're often seen in streams and flooded ditches. Uh, they're not very widespread in Ontario. And its similarity to the leopard frog sometimes uh, confuses the casual observer, but there are, as we mentioned, some of those key identification features to keep in mind. Notice the range is also substantially smaller, so these are very limited to eastern and southern Ontario. The mink frog is our next frog. It's about the same size, again, as, as the pickerel frog. It's about 4.8 to 7.6 centimeters. It's green or brown or slightly olive color. It has no dorsal lateral folds, so you can see that. Uh, and, it, and they're usually absent or very poorly developed. What's interesting about this one is you see it's not spotted. It actually has more blotchy, um, irregular blotching um, that's dark on a sort of a lighter green background. So unlike the pickerel frog or the leopard frog, which have clearly defined spots, this one doesn't. It also gives off a unique odor, uh, odor a musky odor, when it's handled or disturbed. So again, the mink frog with its blotchy sort of green and, and brown appearance, they're found usually in weed-choked sluggish rivers, shoreline, bog line, uh, swamps, etc. They're found usually in central and, and slightly northern Ontario. The calls are heard in about June and July, and the tadpoles will spend the winter in the water and transform in June or July of the following year. They will feed opportunistically on a whole range of, of insects and invertebrates and other creatures as well. And now that we've finished all of our frogs, now we're going to move on to toads. So contrasting everything that you've seen about frogs before, so the dorsal lateral folds, the coloring and patterning, the dorsal lateral ridges, toads are different. So toads have, of course, hind limbs, which are very different, as we already talked about. Their, their feet, of course, or their toes are more separated. Their skin is dry and wart-like looking. And, of course, they have that particular blister-like poison gland behind the eye. All toads will have them. So, again, these are our characteristics to contrast them with the frogs that we've just spent some time discussing. One of our very common toads in Ontario is the American toad. It's between 5 to 11 centimeters long, roughly. It's short, stocky, warty skin, relatively brown or tan or tannish brown. We also look for the large kidney shaped uh, paratoid gland behind the eyes. The American toad is the most terrestrial amphibian. It's very active after rain and evenings and usually can be found in urban areas, gardens, parks, etc. The toads will breed in April and May and the toads will breed in temporary ponds. The male has a very unique uh, call which we encourage you to check out the other PowerPoint to see and the range of this toad is quite extensive so you can see here by the map it's essentially virtually almost everywhere in Ontario. Now the Fowler's toad is another toad, of course, the second, the only of two that we discuss in this course, and it is usually confused with the American toad for a couple of reasons. However, there are some differences to pay attention to. So one of the things are is that it usually only has three to four warts um, in brownish blotches on their back. So unlike the other toad, which was covered with warts, you can see here, there are bumps for sure, but there are only actually a, a very few number of actual Diff different colored warts. Also, when you look carefully at the bony ridges behind, they actually they actually touch the front line of the parotid gland. So again, it, certainly in terms of size, that could also be very different. So when contrasting between the Fowler's toad and the uh, American toad, it's good to keep in mind that you're looking for these two features, really, to differentiate it from the American toad. So assume American toad and then go through for these two characteristics and then determine whether or not it is, in fact, a Fowler's toad. Another of the more realistic ways to determine whether it's a Fowler's toad or not is actually to look at its range map. This is a very endangered species, um, so you can see its range is extremely limited to the very, very southern uh, edges of Ontario. 
So again, the chances of you finding a phylogist toad if you're not in these areas are slim to none. So you would, of course, assume you found an American toad. So again, just to be aware that it is endangered, but it is quite similar. The, they are found in lakeside marshes and ponds along the shore of Lake Erie. Uh, they begin to call in May and June. Um, their tadpoles are black and develop very quickly and hibernate under the sand on raised beaches. So again, those beaches are unfortunately used by tourists, which is one of the reasons contributing to their uh, endangered status. Amphibians are declining around the world, which is one of those unfortunate things. It's actually been called Earth's sixth mass extinction. Um, there are about 20, 122 species that have gone extinct since 1980, with more than 70% of the world's amphibian species in actual decline. So there are a good chunk of them being threatened, and a good chunk of them, of course, uh, considered endangered. 